We're sitting here with Lisa in the pink wing of the West Versailles suite at the infamous Cheetah Club in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Much has been made about you being the rock star who has made the successful transition yeah, to film. Well, let's, I guess wait, now let's wait and see. I <laughs> <laughs> but you always said that you felt you always were acting, even when you were on stage doing a rock concert. Quite so, Particularly yeah. when you were on stage yeah. doing a rock concert. Yeah, I've never been quite at ease as a rock and roller. I've never felt myself to be a natural rock and roller. I'm very envious of, of uh, guys who really feel the part. <laughs> you said that you're not a rock singer and that you never felt you were, or you never felt yeah. you were a rock star. Yeah. But I mean, David, there was a period there, certainly for about five years in the 70s, when you really sort of epitomized the rock star, didn't you? Sure, I mean, I had, yeah. I, costumes and I was superficially applauded as representing rock at that time and in that character. But I, I certainly was uneasy with the thing. Were you uneasy with it while you were doing it, or just in retrospect? Do you look back on it now? In immediate feel... retrospect, at the zenith of that particular time, um, it emotionally disturbed me to a point where I, I really couldn't contain myself in that situation. Uh, it drove me bonkers. This is after the Ziggy thing. Yeah, yeah, going into the mid seventies. That period. 75, 76. Well, you've spoken quite a bit about, you know, having lived that role, mm. that whole Ziggy Stardust thing and, and the whole main man organization around you. And I think that came that. about because uh, it was a desperate and, and contrived effort to become a rock and roll singer because uh, I obviously had to support that role and that function because I was being um, re received as such very successfully. And I, I did try very hard to be a um, straight out and out rock and roll singer living a rock and roll lifestyle. But it certainly didn't uh, fall easily with me. You keep saying you're not naturally into the role, or you really are shy. Yeah. Did you consciously have to force yourself to do all this stuff yeah. to overcome it? Were you aware of it while you were doing Absolutely. it? Absolutely. You sat down, and it was that contrived. You yes. said, David, I have to do this. I would this contrive a character to sing my songs for me, because I don't think that I've got the nerve to sort of go out and do them um, without a character. And so, I mean, that was it. Ziggy was a wonderful protection, it seemed, at the time. And especially as the whole thing seemed to come together and make so much sense logically to um, uh, create the album around the character who carried the show, who, in fact, wasn't real. I mean, the whole thing just made a lovely, obtuse sense to me. The kind of contradiction that I'm so infatuated by. <laughs> How long do you think that character existed? I mean, it was from <coughs> the album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Well, I mean, that, uh, and quite, through what? Down yeah, I mean, I don't, obviously he didn't exist at all. All it was is my own turmoil of mine giving me problems, but I was um, apt to believe that he existed all that time alongside me. I mean, it was my own uh, inner turmoil that was getting a punishment. Had nothing to do with Ziggy Stardust, of course. Before that album, there was another character. I mean, there was yeah. David Bowie who came over here with Mary Jane shoes and something that looked like a dress and, yeah. you know, Greta Garbo hair and hat. And that was yeah. another character Well, it was well. my neo-pre-Raphaelite look. Yeah. <laughs> it was very nice, it was, too. <laughs> and before, and it's my Gabriel that, Rossetti. And before that, you were, you were sort of hippie-ish, weren't you? Yes. I mean, Right. Yeah. And then there was all that sort of mime stuff, and then the Tony Newley voice. Yeah, and the mod stuff before that. And then after Ziggy, we had this, this what, this thin white dude character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, then that we had point. the soul singer, right, and the Frank Sinatra. Yes, all that went through that, that, that was all very quick change around that period, wasn't it? When young Americans through. That was uh, the start of the, uh, of the knowing that very soon I was going to have to drop off all those um, characters. Do you feel that you were trapped in this kind of shy, nervous, insecure persona and you used those characters to get out of it and then you became trapped in those characters or was it just really a device to make it? I mean, you just wanted to get noticed and attention and that that was a clever, contrived, calculated way to do it. It was very hard to divorce the two from each other. I think a certain amount of it was, uh, look at me, but an awful lot of it had to do with wanting to very much do something very exciting on stage and something that I felt nobody had really accomplished or had even seen as a, a, a possible way of, of changing rock and roll theatre. Because I'd always seen rock and roll as some form of theatre. Yeah, from Chuck Berry through Little Richard, I mean, that was theatre. 
Of course it's theatre. It's simplistic theatre, but it's theatre nonetheless. And I thought, well, I really like the idea of combining theatre with rock. A lot of it came out of that, and I was not unaware that it would certainly attract attention as well. So the two things, I mean, went hand in hand with each other, Sean. I think if you relate what I was doing to a lot of the bands who picked up on the idea of doing theatre uh, with rock, I think you can still find a lot of what I did very substantial. As looking back on it now, a lot of the theatre stuff, we, it, was, it was very good. It was very good. I, st I, have, I still have a lot of pride about the uh, construction of all those characters and the, and the way they were presented. I think it was really interesting. It must have been great to be in the audience. Eric Clapton said something interesting the other day. We were talking about drug problems and drink problems and so forth, and he said that with rock and roll it's like a club because you see how low you can get. I don't like the club atmosphere in rock and roll. There's a lot of people in rock and roll that I really like, but I like them when they can be pulled out of that rock and roll club atmosphere because it, it just breeds an incestuous, one-dimensional way of thinking and, and acting and, and reacting to situations and people. And un unfortunately, the other thing it breeds that I found happening to me a lot is that one judges other people's welfare in relation to how it can enhance one's own. It produces the most e extraordinary, selfish, greedy kind of attitude. Only finding that people can be your friend if they're useful to you in a way of building up your ego or looking after you physically or y the dependency, mm -hmm. and you start to regard people as how useful are they to me in... in emotionally or physically and instead of just really caring for other people and saying you know I'm glad that person's doing well or whatever as far as musicians go I've never been buddy buddy with musicians ever I yeah. don't hang out with my musicians very much but you have been friendly with Iggy um, yeah when I really started to want to care about other people more than I, I had done it was people like Iggy that I, I maintained a, a very healthy relationship with Mick, to, to a casual extent, we've sort of sparred around with each other over the years, but we still have what I think is probably a pretty good relationship compared to most. You did say something very funny about him once you were talking sure about... Sure I did. <laughs> about how he's Do we afraid, have to repeat it? He's afraid to walk into a room thinking anything because you might steal it. Now, you did yeah. have this terrible reputation for years as sort of a mm. thief. Mm. And what you said to me once was that you said, I'm a synthetic artist. Mm. You said, I'm a synthetic rock star. Synthetic means unauthentic, sham, imitation, as opposed to synthesize, which means merge, fuse, combine. Now, no, which a synthetic of those do you artist, a synthetic, a, 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 a synthetic piece or a synthetic device is something which is a reproduction of that which is real. Rebel Rebel, Gene Genie, Suffragette City, yeah. all of those, you know, yeah. as well as fashion. Those are real songs. No? Uh, Yes, so yeah, I would, not, I would certainly not fault you there. But when you say reproduction, then <laughs> yeah. what's the difference between the Stones re reproducing myself what as an artist? Myself do. as an artist, not necessarily the the output. I mean, the output stands or falls for what it is, but the uh, presentation and the attitude that went with the presentation of the songs was um, a, a contrived effort to present them in an interesting fashion that had very little to do with the way that I really am. What is the way that you really are? Quiet, shy, modest. Uh. <laughs> now you said once that there's so many shells around you that you don't know what the pee looks like anymore. Yeah, well, really? I've gone through that. I'm pretty aware of what I, I'm like now. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. I feel pretty, pretty happy about my um, own relationship to the world now. You said something also about having stripped away all these things about yourself that you didn't like. Yeah. At the time, I probably thought that, how, you know, that I was trying to contrive a, a, a position for myself. But looking back, a lot of it was unconsciously probably very true. So the thing about peeling off the areas that I didn't like is quite true. I mean, I didn't. I came to have little respect for the way I treated people. Um, I think that had to be changed a lot. I had to um, unload my own need to survive, which I felt was a, a desperate thing. Uh, by getting out of uh, America, I think, had a lot to do with that. Helped. Why? Uh, I just had to remove myself from the club. Los Angeles, particularly. That, <laughs> particularly Los Angeles, yeah. yeah. In fact, I think since 76, I've stayed there for no more than 72 hours, I think.
Yeah. Something like that. The last time I went to him was for the Johnny Carson show, and I stayed there for 12 and a half hours. <laughs> No, I know the well, I, I have to break that down because that's quite ridiculous, you know. But it's um, insupportable fear of Los Angeles. There's, there's a place that really cracks me up. But I still really get the heebie-jeebies when I walk through or drive through down Sunset and all that. At one point, you said it was your favourite museum. Yeah, I don't think so anymore. There was a period of time, I guess, mid '70s, when you really were not in the best of physical say I was quite weary Health. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean you were a bit out of it yeah as, far as I recall and um, what got you through that I, I mean what had you I think friends that? I did have some incredibly loyal friends at the time ones who weren't taken in by the whole glamour or whatever and the uh, psychophantic atmosphere at the time surrounding me one which I'd sort of encouraged myself naturally but I kept I kept high most of the time to get myself through it it seems now looking back at it because I just felt so damned uncomfortable when I was straight <laughs> and in that position. What was happening then? I mean, you had split from Main Man. Mm. Were you, did you feel sort of lost and unprotected in terms of people looking after you, just trying to get yourself back in your own I wasn't control. trying to get myself back into anything. That's the trouble. I mean, when I did leave Main Man, um, I just went to pieces for a couple of years completely. Unfortunately as well, but what didn't help is that I had a vast success at the same time. As I left Main Man, I had Young Americans happen as an album and fame and all those things, which is <laughs> quite ironic. Uh, <laughs> the, the lyrics of that particular song rang so true for me at the time. Um, that certainly wasn't a contradiction in terms. The theory really sort of was a mirror image of what I was going through. I would never really have admitted that at that particular time. But I did fall completely to pieces. I wasn't pulling anything together. I was just wallowing even further in a mire of um, disuse and abuse. Why did you work with Nile Rogers? I li I've liked Nile's work. I like the way that he works with rhythm. I, it started off, I think, I recognised in Nile a quality of rhythm and blues that I recognised from way back. Um, and over the last six or seven months, I've been playing nothing but rhythm and blues records. I've gone back to my old collection, been playing everything from Alan Freed, Big Band, Johnny Otis, Bobby Gregg, even Buddy Guy. <laughs> just like my original collection, I've dragged out Little Richard singles that I haven't played in years, stuff when he was just Richard Wayne Penniman and singing back up in a band and stuff. And just listening to the, the, how exciting it used to be and why it used to be the exciting. And not having the feeling of the six-month mix behind them. The things were done in a week or whatever. I'm quite very happy that I've... I did this album in three weeks flat, and the moment we went in, we were mixed by the end of the third week, finished. And that, that's the kind of feeling I wanted. And Niall had exactly the same references of, of albums and records and artists that he liked. And I, I wanted that kind of encouraging humanist approach to the new album. I didn't want to get pulled back into the uh, stiff, icy, mechanised feel that's so rampant on, on a lot of my latter albums. This album is probably the simplest album I've ever done. What do you mean simple? It makes very warm, understandable musical statements. It has a warm response. I hope that it's uh, uh, the most emotionally uplifting of uh, the albums I've made in a long time. It's a very positive album, I think. Is that how you're feeling? Relatively. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very positive, very positive. Why? I see life as a challenge again. I think that a challenge and an exciting one at that. And I refuse to be brought down by the disastrous zeitgeist that we've enabled to bring upon ourselves. I think we've got to fight through that. We've got to be positive about our days on this planet. I never realized you were such an optimist. Well, I never was particularly. <laughs> You're more romantic than people give you credit for. I'm feeling a lot more romantic. <laughs> um, uh, probably, I, I think I'm probably a lot more emotional than people would think that I, I, I was. I think, again, that went part and parcel with the disguise. I think it was necessary for me to appear to be one uh, faceted emotionally, and that was one of driving <laughs> a blinkered um, totalitarianism. That felt necessary at the time to get these very cartoon characters over. They had to be almost one-dimensional themselves to be effective. But um, 
as I say, that that, that all contrived to become a great nightmare because I'm I'm not like that. I'm, I'm I am emotionally very responsive to life and people. I found over the last few years. In the early 70s, all of the publicizing of your unconventional marriage and bisexuality and all of that stuff, were you just being honest about your life or was it a gimmick? You did say that you thought that it was the best thing that you ever said in terms of getting attention. Mm. I don't think those things are ever as one-sided or, or I don't think they're quite as solidly placeable as that. I don't think they're easy to pinpoint. How much of it was a desire to become known, but all, on the other hand, I was always an experimenter, I think. And those, the, particularly those few years, I was experimenting with my emotional life, as, and that was the dangerous thing, as well as everything else, as well as theatre and, and rock. I put myself, really threw myself through a, a test of absorbing every possible experience that I could while I was young, not with no real realisation of, of what happens later in life, how that you even are going to be around later. And it's the old adage about if I'd known I'd live this long, I would have looked after myself better. You know, a lot of that. But no, I mean, it, I, I can't say I regret any of it in any way. I mean, it was one vast experiment. I've learnt a lot through it. You always said Angela was the only woman that you thought you could live with for more than a week at a time. That was very odd because as it happens, we hardly saw each other at all during the entire thing. And do remember, Again, I've been divorced for seven years. And before that, and up until that period, for a good good couple of years, we hadn't really seen each other at all. I hardly knew the girl, and she really didn't know me. The whole thing was thrown together, and, and it was overnight, and before it had even started, it was over, you know. And uh, the only great thing that came out of it was my son. Do you have any room in your life for any kind of real relationship? More like room that? than I've ever had before. Really? I mean, I'm not... I'm not surrounded. I don't. Uh, you of all people must have noticed that the the entourage thing with me is practically non-existent, relatively, in any public situation. Or obviously, there's a couple of people around. It seems, but uh, generally, I mean, I'm very much a free agent. Again, I learnt that from being in Berlin that it was quite easy to cope with life on my own or with just a couple of friends. That I didn't need the cocooning of. Um, a rock and roll existence. All that was just all very important to me. You know, I've always been a confirmed traveller. I just travel. I love it. I love travelling. But now I just travel on my own or with a friend. I mean, it's it's no problem. You know. You said that being in love, you thought was like a disease. Yeah. It was horrible and it yeah, bred so jealousy. Yeah. I think I've, I think I've I think I've grown to um, um, feel a distaste for that that statement. Really? Yeah, I think that was... Uh, it's not a mistake. Yes, that's what I felt at the time, quite definitely. I'd had such bad things happen to me. I felt all my own sort of um, choosing, really, um, through my own dabbling and experimenting and, and pushing myself to limits and all that. But uh, I'm, I'm much more comfortable. I'm not in love. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. But, uh, I, you know, I could see it happening, yeah. I really? Could, yeah. Did you see sharing your life with somebody in that kind yeah. of partnership yeah. And way? Yeah, I can see that quite easily. Having shared it with m my son, yes, I like sharing things. I, li I like sharing life. It's one of the most gracious things and uh, most rewarding feelings, being able to share life with somebody else. You know? yeah. Dylan, what is this room? I know, I oh, know, Dylan. that's a stunner. Because I remember once you told me, <laughs> you once told me that you'd met Dylan and had a rather unfortunate evening with him or something somewhere. Or I do. I do. You were babbling or I, I dimly or recollect <laughs> it. <laughs> so, so you're not producing I'm sure Dylan. if I remember the evening, he only dimly recollects it as well. But it was uh, one sorry. of those great nights in uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> Somebody's wonderful house and I guess there was probably a wonderful jacuzzi in there somewhere. And it's just one of those wonderful nights, and we had a wonderful conversation. One word of which I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> I know we were playing each other's records. I was like, listen to mine, now listen to mine. I know it was one of those dreadful evenings, that's all I really remember of it. I liked him a lot, I thought he was nice. If I'd shut up and listened to him, I probably would have liked him even more, but I seem to remember talking an awful lot, <laughs> over, through and under everything he was saying. I think we talked at each other for an entire evening. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you haven't seen him since? Ghastly. Yeah, I've run, I've run into him a couple of times in, in clubs in New York, funnily enough. 
Uh, I wouldn't say that we're, <laughs> we're friends or anything. I was as surprised as anybody to read that thing the other day. I'm sure that there's absolutely nothing to support that whatsoever. <laughs> it's been the last thing on my mind. I'm terribly flattered if indeed there's any kind of truth in it, but um, I'm totally unaware of that situation. You've told me that you hate <clears throat> touring. Why are you doing it again? This one, because I, I've readjusted to the situation. I think I can thoroughly enjoy a tour this time. Um, I enjoy the music that I've never played on stage, any of them. I've got the three albums that I did with Eno, um, Scary Monsters, plus the new album. That's five albums worth of stuff that I've never really been able to um, take out on stage. Um, and I, I, I miss it, so it, the, the edge of excitement is definitely there for me. The last tour that I did, I think, was the 77, 78 tour, which is the nearest that I've ever got to sort of just having a good time on stage. I just felt I was so much happier on that one. I don't know if it, if it came over like that, but I was um, much more... I was totally in control of the situation by that time because I'd already been in Berlin a couple of years, one and a half years by then, and I was really starting to adjust to things, and I thoroughly enjoyed that tour. That was a, a great tour. And the other thing that really was a, a big help and also gave me more fun than anything else was going out with Iggy as a pianist. I mean, that was just terrific. You did say you got drunk a lot, though, didn't you? What, During on his tour? tour? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, you said you planned to get drunk. Right? I, I planned remember. to get drunk, but, but um, as it happens, it was, uh, it was just a very fulfilling, contented kind of tour. And it was great fun being in the back as one of the band and not having that same kind of responsibility, having to shoulder that sort of spearheading a show thing. And uh, I looked at stage very differently after that. Oh. I thought, well, if I can, if one can take the same attitude up front as well, um, that would be a nice way to be able to go on stage. And that's what I started doing on that very last tour. And no doubt that will carry through into this next tour as well. I just wanted to come in touch with a common factor because I feel a need at the moment to be part of a society again in those terms or not seem to be some kind of alien freak on the outside which I'm very much not you know and having traveled an awful lot feel more and more part of everything and I wish to express that feeling I don't want to seem as though I'm uh, detached and cold because I'm not it's the ultimate swing of the pendulum when things reach a point to one extreme there will be a natural gravitation back to it a point which is the antithesis of that one. So you get a, a musical vocabulary which is for the uh, larger part high-tech and uh, um, icy and seemingly very self-possessed. There's going to be sooner or later a swing back to well what is the other side of that coin? You think there's too many synthesizers now? It's not that so much. I think it's the interpretation placed on the synthesizer. I think the synthesizer is a wonderful piece of um, mechanization. <laughs> but I think it's been grouped into one very passive voice at the moment. It becomes it becomes the vocal point for the technical society. It's a shame that it's fallen into that very narrow corridor. But that's the synthesizer at its most accessible point, of course. And I believe the use of the synthesizer has almost become a caricature of itself. It, it almost parodies itself. Everything is eh, eh, or oh, 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 and that's like its only vocabulary now, which is a shame because uh, in the beginning when we first started messing about with that, that thing, it, it was, there was a universe of expression in there somewhere. I wanted to use musicians I'd never seen, met or even heard before. Why? Um, there's a, a point where it can become a, a familiarity between musicians, between the composer and the musician, which is fine if you, if you want a particular sound that, that's... Um, preordained which is great but if you want the unexpected if you start to be uh, able to predict how a guitarist or a pianist is going to play what you've written then kind of the f well for me the fun goes I want the surprise so I wanted to work with musicians who didn't know my process of working and whose accomplishments I wasn't aware of um, just to give it some a new verve because you're a little bit scared of each other and you play at a kind of a, a more desperate higher pitch they're really interesting guys. They were astonishingly receptive to what I wanted to do, considering we'd never worked together before. But, as general, with my usual unease, uh, I get very scared of telling musicians what to play if I don't know them too well, because the things that I usually want musicians to, to play are quite bizarre. And you tell a sax player to play in a particular fashion, 
you kidding me? <laughs> Let us know. He's not playing a saxophone. What are you, 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 know, you put me on. Um, and so he said, well, uh, uh, play it your own way then. <laughs> but we you got really it. You really get timid we, in the studio? I do get timid with new musicians, very. Very. I, I, I'm terribly quiet for the first week or so, but I, I, I start to open up after that. The ultimate thing, I think, is a, a, a warmth that hasn't been apparent in my album since, possibly since Young Americans. What about all your retirements? Uh, they were all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the time, you felt that was it, right? Well, it living really under pressure, you know. Weren't yeah. going to do them anymore. No more tours. Obviously, you quite uh, one quite <laughs> believes them all the way. I'm mean, very con convinced that what one is saying is going to be the future. That that's it. Yeah. Uh, never again. I don't think I dare ever say that again. No. Through experience, having gone through the, those 10 or 12 years, I now see that what happens is that you get discouraged at some point or you <coughs> lose interest at some point and you stop, you redefine and readjust to the situation and then feel the spark of enthusiasm again and want to do some more. And that's what happens, that's what it's like and it's a process. I thought it was retiring. I thought because it never happened to me before. And you suddenly lose interest or something goes and you think, oh, this must be what it's like and I guess this is retiring because I'm not going to go through something that I really hate. And so I say, well, that's it, I've retired. But what in fact happens is that your balance shifts and then another kind of enthusiasm comes back from a different place toward the music and, and the reason why you're doing it. You seem very sure of yourself and very sort of content and you I'm, seem I'm at so ease with yourself. I'm at ease with myself, yeah. Yeah. You've always been so good at being convincing, you know, whatever it was at the time. Yeah. I mean, I is see. it possible that this is just I another see what's role? Coming, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, isn't it awful? It's the boy who cried wolf syndrome, isn't it? Well, one thing that I am sure about is that I'm quite definitely not out of my gourd anymore. Right, not <laughs> um, that I've fully established over the last six or seven years. And I think that I, because of that, I can now examine what I'm, I'm really thinking and really feeling from a very sane position. Well, relatively sane. And I believe that, that, that there is a thread of uh, um, meaning running through my life at the moment that I have no wish at the moment to break, that I feel it's leading somewhere fulfilling and positive. And if I feel that way, then I make every effort to make that part of my music now. What about the music from that period? Do you think it still holds up? Do you like those albums? Uh, Ziggy and... You know, Diamond Dogs and well, even Hunky Dory. I mean, the early ones. I think the odd track has longevity to it. I think a lot of it was very much mm. of its time. For my own musical satisfaction, Diamond Dogs is the album that still lives for me as an album, much more than Ziggy's music. In fact, I think the identification of Ziggy uh, was terribly right for that particular period. But I think the mu but musically, I think the Diamond Dog stuff is, is was really good, really exciting. And still is.